Good evening, and thank you for joining us as I click through my stuff here. <clears throat> Creation Fellowship in Santee has been meeting for 10 years, eight years in person, and presently online for two years. We're a group of people who come together to learn more about the six-day creation account that happened some 6,000 years ago. You can find Creation Fellowship Santee as a public page, where we're live streaming Facebook right now, and a private group on Facebook. You can watch past presentations on our video platforms at YouTube, Rumble, and BitChute by searching Creation Fellowship Santee or just CFS 2020. If you have questions or would like to get on our emailing list, I am responsible for the email and I do not spam. I send out one email a week or sometimes two if I find newsworthy information. Send us an email at creationfellowshipsantee at gmail.com with questions or to get on our e emailing list. We're doing a new thing this year. We're partnering with Throughout All Ages Ministries and uh, I'm going to pass this over to Stacy, and she can tell us all about that and open us up in prayer and introduce our speaker. Stacey, Absolutely. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer right now. So if you guys all join me, that would be wonderful. All right. Father God, we just thank you for this time and all the wonderful ministries you provide for us weekly. And we're just so thankful thankful for that. We pray that you would be with this evening's study and that you would bless us and bless the speaker and that everything that comes from him, that would be from you, Lord. We pray that for this time and we give it over to you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. So hi, everyone. I'm Stacy with Throughout All Ages Ministry. What we do is go into the public schools to build up the student's character to intellectually help point them to think about their worldview so they can weigh it with truth because the statistics are 65 to 85 per percent of kids who grow up in a Christian home walk away from their faith. And so if you would like more information, please go to throughoutallagesministry.com. So anyways, I'm gonna announce our speaker. His name is David Rees author, speaker, and researcher, and TV host. David's world travel and research has made an in -demand, him an in-demand speaker with an abundance of knowledge and his powerful and inspirational del delivery makes learning about Bible history and science fun and easy for an audience of all ages. Um, his his weekly TV show, Creation in the 21st Century, airs to millions on and globally on TBN. Also, um, Genesis Science Network launched as a mission-based free 24-7 TV channel that broadcasts globally. You can watch anytime online, Fire Stick or Fire TV or Roku. Also, last but not least, in Tennessee, he also has a creation museum that has an immense amount of foundational resources. And with no further ado, I'm excited to announce our guest speaker, David Rees. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here again. Uh, you know, I want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in to the live stream who might be watching um today we are have an unprecedented situation where we have been handed this narrative this atheistic narrative that there is uh there is just something about nature that science has been able to tell us nature is all there is that we don't need god and I'm telling you what, that's dangerous. We're seeing the result of that everywhere we go. We're seeing it in the, in the media. We're seeing it on social media. We're seeing it every time we turn on the TV. And what's worse, young school children are learning that this is fact. This is the way it's supposed to be. I mean, we were talking pre-show about uh, situations where grandchildren going through museums, looking at dinosaurs, and they... They stand up and they're like, you, you know, we know how these things got there. They were buried in the flood. And 
the people running the museum or running these displays immediately counter and they're like, no, 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 this was an asteroid strike, a meteor strike. Well, wait a second, were you there? And so even though we try to share the truth, we're bombarded with this atheistic agenda. And, you know, for, for me, it's about changing the narrative. It's about time that we drop these antiquated views of evolution, these antiquated views that were produced, you know, 150 years ago that says that you and I were nothing more than accidents, the result of random chance, star stuff from a big bang 14 billion years ago. And I'm telling you what, that is dangerous to society. Uh, it has resulted in a lot of atrocities. We're talking about rises in teen suicide, veteran suicide, school shootings, all sorts of things going on. If only we took it more seriously that we are made in the image of God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, boy, what a difference would that make in not only America, but in the world right now. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is kind of talk you, talk you through uh, some of God's wonders, because, I mean, I love focusing on the positive. And there are an innumerable number of wonders that point us back to God's design. So I call those wonders without number. There's a passage in the book of Job where Job's going through a really difficult time, obviously. And he's reminded, there's a passage that says that God does great things past finding out and wonders without number. So if you think about that for a second, you realize that, yeah, God's done things that in this life we'll never know. Okay, those, that's exciting to think that we're going to learn a lot in eternity about the way God made everything. But he's done great things past finding out, but he's done wonders without number. In other words, there are innumerable number of wonders that we can study, that we can use science, like our logic, our reasoning, our intelligence to study, and we can give him the glory for it. So those things I like to call wonders without number. And uh, based off of that passage in the book of Job, we're just going to touch on a, a couple over the next few minutes. I want to talk about uh, wonders in mathematics, wonders of our special earth, wonders in the universe, and the ultimate wonder. And, you know, first, I'd be remiss if I didn't add that we have this evolutionary theory that is being forced upon us, which is a naturalistic creation account of how the universe came to be, which is directly opposed to what we read in the book of Genesis, in God's word. God tells us that he made everything in the beginning. And this evolutionary account tells us, no, nature is all there is. Nature explains everything given enough time. So Charles Darwin, of course, most people know the story. He lived during the 1800s. He was actually studying to become a pastor when he realized that he kind of liked collecting beetles more than he liked his pastoral studies. So he jumps on a ship, the HMS Beagle, and he travels to the Galapagos Islands where he sees different birds. And these different birds, they're all finches, but they kind of have a uh, slight variation. Some of them have large beaks, some of them have small beaks, some of them have different colorations based on the islands where he's at. And he realizes, well, hey, these things are adapting to whatever situation they're placed in. And that's, that's true. That's observable, repeatable, demonstrable, empirical. Good science. That yes, animals adapt to whatever situation God has placed them in. We adapt to whatever situation God has placed us in. But adaptation is not evolution. So he sees this adaptation and he immediately takes it way too far. <laughs> that's right. Darwin said, well, if animals can adapt in tiny ways like this, then what if we just give it millions upon millions of years? Maybe we can turn an ape-like creature into a human, or maybe we can turn a hippopotamus into a giraffe, or maybe we can turn an amoeba into an astronaut. And of course, this is so far off track from what we actually observe in science that it's astounding it's made it this long as a scientific theory, yet that's what's being taught in schools, universities, and colleges around the world today. So Charles Darwin kind of had a credibility problem. Uh, you see, he admitted in the closing comments of his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races. He said, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. Wait a second, Charles Darwin is admitting that there's a creator here, or is he? 
you see, he had, had a really bad credibility problem because he later admitted, he said, you know, I regretted that I truckled a public opinion and used the Pentateuchal term of creator, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. In other words, what he's saying is that he put the words by the creator into his book so that he could sell more books, so that it would be more palatable for the Christians who might be reading it, okay? So God used evolution is basically what he's saying, but that's not what he meant. He meant that all of these animals appeared by an unknown process over millions of years. So this is a two-faced man that many people look up to as revolutionary in the fields of science, and yet he was flip-flopping based on political opinions. He was trying to sell more books. You know, our top universities have a long history of Christian tradition uh, and biblical origins, yet later turning to an atheistic stance. Uh, for instance, Yale was established in 1701 in an effort to train preachers. Their uh, coat of arms to this day contains the biblical phrase, uh, urim and thummim, light and truth. And they even actually have that written in Hebrew on their coat of arms to this day. But they've gone a long ways from that because you see, you can visit the Yale Peabody Museum and you can see something like this, the ascent from ape-like creature into man over millions of years. If you have any question about it whatsoever, today you can go to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and you can meet your relatives. Okay, so we're being taught as fact that these ape-like creatures are our relatives over millions of years. This is inherently a dangerous view because it means that somewhere along the line, some forms of humans are less human than others, are closer to apes than others, which is also an inherently racist viewpoint. And if you read Charles Darwin's writings on, uh, on the descent of man, there are some incredibly racist viewpoints in that book. So you have to be really, really careful about this. And again, this is a man who is held up as revolutionary in his field. Yeah, he revolutionized things, but not in a scientific way, in a very dangerous way. I, I always ask people, what effect does evolution have on our faith? Why, why can't we just accept that evolution's not a great importance? Maybe we can try to fit it into scripture. Maybe we can compromise in some way. But Proverbs says, every word of God is pure. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So in other words, why would we be trying to compromise and insert ideas into scripture that are clearly not there in the literal context of the book of Genesis? You know, again, I say, why should we really be concerned? Can it really be a dangerous issue? Absolutely. It's a very dangerous issue. Joseph Stalin was leader of the Soviet Union. He was an atheist, obviously, but he imprisoned millions in labor camps. Official records indicate he killed about 3 million people. It was probably a lot more than that. And he promoted, and I get this now, he promoted atheistic education in the public school system, something that we see going on in the States, in America today. It's going on right now here. But this is what he did. So what was his foundation? What was his basis for doing all of this? Well, he was walking with a, a childhood friend one day when he volunteered a pretty revealing statement. He said, you know, they're fooling us. There is no God. I'll lend you a book to read, and it will show you that all this talk about God is sheer nonsense. And uh, uh, the world and all living things are quite different from what you imagine. Okay, so his friend is like, what are you talking about? What book? And immediately he comes back with the reply, Darwin, you must read it. In other words, Darwin changed his mind about the value of human life, about the existence of God, about so many different things. Darwinism, or evolution, is the first step in a very dangerous path that leads us down the wrong way. And of course, when I say evolution, I'm not talking about adaptation. I'm not talking about survival of the fittest, the fastest gazelle is going to get away from the lion. No, I'm talking about Darwinian evolution, or what I like to more clearly specify, universal common descent. That's the idea that everything in the universe descended from a common ancestor, like an amoeba, millions or billions of years in the past. So it's this idea that things have evolved by nature over millions of years from one type of an animal into another type of an animal. No evidence whatsoever. So Darwinism, very dangerous. Even today, there's still a debate going on, evolution versus creation, random chance, or inspired design. 
basically, are we created with purpose or were we conceived from chaos? And that was the subtitle that I put on my first book, Wonders Without Number, because I realized that that kind of boils it down. Were we conceived with purpose or were we conceived from chaos? There are only two options here. And of course, there are on, there's only one option that makes sense scientifically, historically, observably, and from a Christian perspective. So from a Christian perspective, we have to be consistent when we study scripture. So what is our foundation? Um, you know, I think that our foundation can be found in the first verse of scripture. Uh, in the Hebrew, it says, Bereshith parai Elohim et hashemayim be'et taretz. In the English, we know it as in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And this monumental verse is the origin of time itself. It's the origin of space. It's the origin of matter. It's the origin of the entire universe. So everything past that, if that's the origin of time, everything past that in history is stacked up on that one verse being true. You strip that verse away and everything falls flat. So we have to have this as our foundation as Christians to understand the gospel message itself. Now, did Jesus teach with the same foundation? Yeah, absolutely he did. He said, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. Moses, he was writing about me. So a lot of people immediately say, well, wait a second, you're talking about Moses? The Old Testament was writing about Jesus? Absolutely. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was in the beginning, the one doing the creating. He actually existed before all things by him was, were all things created. Nothing was made that was made without Jesus Christ. So in other words, we're talking about God here, but we're talking about Jesus because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So yeah, he's there at creation, working his power to create the universe. Now, if Jesus had the same foundation, if we have a Christian foundation, what about the founders of America, what foundation did they have? They said, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their government with certain, oh, wait, did I get that wrong? <laughs> that they are endowed by their creator, not their government, not by nature, by their creator with unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Okay, it doesn't get any clearer than that. There is a biblical origin for the foundation of this country. And we have strayed so, so very far. So let's talk about mathematics for a second, because when we look at the foundation of some of the greatest scientists of all times, so I'm talking about Galileo and Kepler and uh, all of these great scientists, we find that they usually had a biblical interpretation for their scientific research. For instance, Galileo, I mean, he was known as the father of modern observational astronomy. He found four of Jupiter's largest moons, named them. Uh, I mean, it, it, he has done so much for science. And so he's this brilliant scientist. And we all know that all brilliant scientists are atheists because an intellectual atheist is the epitome of science. It's the top, no. What was his opinion? He said, mathematics is the language with which God has written the universe. In other words, if you want to understand science, if you want to understand mathematics, if you want to understand nature, look at God, all right? Because mathematics is the language with which God has written the universe. So is this a good foundation to have? Let me tell you the story of a man by the name of Leonardo Fibonacci. Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician. Uh, he lived around 1200 AD, and he traveled with his father into northern Africa, where he became uh, familiar with what we call the Arabic numeral system. So, you know, you had the Roman numeral system, I, I, I uh, equals three. Well, now all of a sudden he's learning about these shorthands and these scribbles and these mathematical equations that you can do using the Arabic numeral system. And um, he started to have fun. So he started proposing this sequence of numbers where every number is the sum of the previous two numbers. Now, I don't know who all is watching right now, but mathematics is intimidating to me, okay? This is a lot simpler than it sounds. I'm just going to put it up on the screen here because you see the very first line says one plus one equals two. You're going to take the last two numbers on that equation, 
drop those down to a new line. So the last two numbers, one plus two equals three. Take those last two numbers, two and three equals five. Three and five equals eight. 13, 21, 34, 55, on and on and on. So we take the numbers in red and, and Fibonacci said, this is a, a fun mathematical sequence. Uh, it's basically just taking the sum of the previous two numbers and adding everything together. And it's a mathematical sequence. It creates the sequence of numbers, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, and so on and so on. Now, yeah, that was a fun exercise in mathematics until we started to find those patterns in nature. For instance, in the pineapple, the pineapple now, pineapple has ridges and you can measure those ridges one way. Let's see if I can put a graphic up on the screen. You can measure those ridges one way and uh, it usually equals eight. You measure the ridges the other way and it equals 13. Okay, both of those are in the Fibonacci sequence. Well, wait a second. That's just a sequence that a man thought up randomly. Why are we finding that in nature? Interesting. It doesn't stop there. Uh, then we realize that the center of a sunflower has all of these seeds in it. Well, the seeds form spirals and rows of spirals. So you start to count the rows of spirals one way, it equals 34. You count the rows of spirals the other way, it equals 55. Wait a second, both of those are in the Fibonacci sequence. What's going on here? This is just a random sequence of numbers that men thought up. Maybe not. And then Brussels sprouts. Now listen, I was blown away when I found this out because Brussels sprouts grow in the Fibonacci sequence. I, growing up, I always thought Brussels sprouts grew like this right here. <laughs> no, seriously, Brussels sprouts do grow in the Fibonacci sequence. And what we realize is that there are these patterns all throughout nature. So then uh, Fibonacci developed this golden ratio where you have this spiral pattern. Let me draw it on the screen. Uh, it's a golden ratio that scales up by 1.618 and it creates the spiral that you see on the screen right now. All right. Uh, again, it's using a piece of graph paper. It's using boxes that represent the one plus one, uh, the one plus two, the two plus three, et cetera. Uh, and then those boxes just get larger and larger and larger. So it creates this golden ratio. Again, just a mathematical exercise, right? Until people started looking at things like the Nautilus shell. Now the Nautilus shell is not a Fibonacci spiral. It has been used as a Fibonacci spiral by some people. They said, oh, the Nautilus shell is a Fibonacci. No, it's not. It's a logarithmic spiral. It is uh, just as fascinating, just as intricate, but it's not quite a Fibonacci spiral. So maybe we should stop trying to look for Fibonacci spirals in nature. Eh, not so fast. The design and the growth of our outer ear starts as a Fibonacci spiral. And then as our earlobe distends, as we get older, so when we're children, it tends to follow a Fibonacci spiral. As we get older, it, it falls away from that perfect Fibonacci spiral. Then we started turning our telescopes upwards and looking out into space and realized that some galaxies follow pretty close to a Fibonacci spiral. Not not perfect, but pretty close. And uh, galaxies like M51, which is on the screen right now, uh, it very closely follows the Fibonacci spiral until you get into those outer arms that have already begun to twist up. It twists up because some time has passed. But if billions of years or even millions of years had passed, those arms should be completely twisted up. We should not see spiral galaxies. And yet we see spiral galaxies in abundance throughout the universe. So this is actually evidence uh, that we have a relatively young universe, thousands, not billions. And then the shape and growth of eggs follow the Fibonacci spiral. We turn our satellites downward and we start taking pictures back towards Earth. Some hurricanes follow a Fibonacci spiral. Coincidence? I don't think so. This is too much to be a coincidence. Numbers are abstract. They don't really exist. They're in our head, okay? Uh, I have a good friend, uh, Dr. Jason Lyle, PhD in astrophysics from the University of Boulder, Colorado. And, and he's like, you can't stump your toe on a number three. And I love the way that he puts that because when you realize that I'm thinking of a number in my head, but that number, it can be expressed on a piece of paper or it can be expressed 
by three items on the table, but that's not actually the number three. The number three doesn't exist. It's only in our brains as a way of comprehending something. So if numbers don't exist, why do we find them all throughout nature? Now, here's where it's so powerful. I mean, this is unbelievable and a testament to the creator. If the universe is all natural processes, then there is no way that we should be able to comprehend mathematical sequences and then find them in nature. But this, if we have a creator who formed the universe, formed the earth using mathematical sequences like Galileo told us, if he formed all of that using mathematical sequences, then he creates us in his image with just a tiny fraction of his ability to comprehend mathematics. Well, then that means that the mathematics that we can comprehend we will probably find that he has used when he created the universe. In other words, we're seeing a fingerprint of God's design with the Fibonacci sequence. And I think that's so incredible. The only way to make sense of it, again, is from a biblical perspective, not just a religious perspective, because all of these other gods, well, these pagan gods throughout history, they, they're very impersonal, and you'll find all of these different stories, but we realize that the God of the Bible told us that he created us in his image, and he loves us enough that he wants to have a personal relationship with us. Again, when we just look at Fibonacci, the Fibonacci sequence in mathematics, we realize, wow, mathematics, numbers are all pointing us about, back to God's wonders that he's left for us to find throughout the universe. So, there's mathematics. Let's move on. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, famous for gravity, an apple falling from a tree, but so much more than that. Sir Isaac Newton was a great scientist. His foundation was remarkably similar to that of Galileo's. He said God created everything by number, weight, and measure. So it wasn't uh, everything created itself. It wasn't, uh, you know, natural selection uh, plus time equals magical design. No, God created everything. And he created it by number, by weight, by measure. He knew what he was doing. There's evidence of a grand designer there. That was his foundation. Is it true? Well, let's look at the order of the earth for just a moment. So, uh, when we look at the universe, which we'll get to in just a moment, when we look at the universe in all its vastness, it's easy, easy to think of the earth as kind of small and insignificant. It's like a tiny speck floating in space, right? But there are some extraordinary characteristics that enables earth to survive in a universe that for the most part is hostile to life. I'll go over a few uh, very quickly. Uh, number one, we live in a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy. It looks something kind of like this. And in the center of this galaxy, we believe there's a very supermassive black hole. Uh, black hole basically means that anything that gets close to the event horizon or passes the event horizon of this black hole is sucked in, disappearing, never to appear again. Not even light can escape this supermassive black hole. I don't want to live there, all right? What about towards the outer edges of the galaxy? Well, there's not enough heavy elements. The things that make up this room, this computer, you and I, they don't exist out there. I don't want to live there. Where do we live? Neither one of those places. We're nestled in the perfect spot for life in between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms of the Milky Way without the threat of supernova, black hole, stellar collisions, or elemental shortages. In short, we're just in the perfect spot of our galaxy for life. And then that brings us to our position in the solar system. You see, uh, we're about 93 million miles away from the sun, which kind of seems trivial. Why do we need to remember this number, 93 million miles? You don't actually have to remember it, but you better be grateful for it. Because if you did not live 93 million miles away from the sun, you would be regretting it right now. Because if we lived about 5% closer, we would be boiling hot, uninhabitable, like the planet Venus. I don't want to live there. And now we argue about this. Astronomers and cosmologists, we're always back and forth, somewhere between 10 and 20% farther. I'm just using uh, the broadest, the greatest number, uh, the most conservative number of 20% farther. But it's more likely 10. Uh, we would become like the planet Mars. We would be freezing cold, like the planet Mars, uninhabitable. I don't want to live there. All right. So we don't. We don't live 10% farther away. We don't live. 5% closer. We live 
in a place that is just right for life. Now, this brings out actually one more huge issue that I might mention. If we had a very elliptical orbit, that's a very oval-shaped orbit around the sun, we would be freezing cold and then boiling hot and then freezing cold and then boiling hot multiple times per year every time we hit uh, <laughs> every time we, we hit the far point of that ellipsis, okay? So we would be in trouble again. Instead, we have a very, very slightly elliptical orbit, which is nearly circular, allowing us to maintain our distance from the sun very well so that we don't boil to death and we don't freeze to death. I'm glad. Now, a couple, one or two of these things might have been coincidence. Now we're looking at a lot more than coincidence our position in the solar system. Um, for instance, we are very small and we're farther into the solar system. We have these big gas giants outside like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, planets like that. And what we find is that when cosmic debris comes streaming into the solar system, a lot of times planets like Jupiter, big planets will pull those fragments in. So the gravity of these big planets kind of act as garbage collectors, you might say. And that's really good because, uh, for example, in 1994, comet Shoemaker-Levy broke apart into uh, 21 fragments. Uh, it was traveling and the tremendous gravity of Jupiter pulled those fragments in. Now, on its way in, it was going about 133,000 miles per hour approximately. Now, at that speed, you and I could travel from New York to LA in about a minute and a half, something like that. All right. So, it was zipping. And when it struck Jupiter, it struck with the force of a million atom bombs and it sent a mushroom shaped cloud of gas uh, over a thousand miles into the atmosphere of Jupiter. Now, if that would have hit Earth, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We would be gone, we would be dead, right? But it didn't. There are garbage collectors farther out in the solar system. Coincidence? I use that word a lot because when you see the vast sheer number of coincidences that would have to happen, it just makes it obvious that there's a designer. When we look at Earth's geomagnetic fields, we see the exact same thing. The, uh, it enables our compasses to be used as a means of navigation. But when cosmic radiation, when the solar wind comes streaming in from the sun, well, instead of just blasting the Earth and baking us all, what it actually does is that that geomagnetic field acts as a deflection shield and the cosmic radiation bounces back out into space, except for a few instances when tiny bits of radioactive material get trapped right around the poles, the north and the south pole of the Earth, which becomes the Aurora Borealis and Australis. That's right. The northern and southern lights are actually a colorful reminder that God has his hands of protection around the earth. He has put a shield around us. And if he ever removed that, his hands of protection, if he ever removed that geomagnetic field, we would be baked to death within minutes. I sure am glad that God knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, I was actually up in British Columbia, Canada on a one week speaking tour a number of years ago. And um, I just finished speaking at a church. Uh, I, I had a family driving me back to my hotel for the night. And on the way, they said, David, do you want to see the largest wooden pier in North America? It's right, right off the highway. And I just so happened to have my good camera and my tripod in the car because, hey, I went to British Columbia, Canada. It's beautiful up there. I said, well, maybe I'll get some shots. So I'm a little bit tired, but yeah, I say, absolutely. Let's take a picture of it. It's dark. We stopped. I set up my tripod, I set up my camera, I frame it towards this big wooden pier. And then in my peripheral vision, I see this little flicker. Well, I swing my camera around, start taking pictures. What you see here, the Aurora came out while I was standing there. And it was better than uh, this family that was driving me. They'd lived there for 20 years or something. It was the best they had ever seen it. The clearest, most vibrant they had ever seen it just so happened to be while I was standing there. And you know, and I don't make it up to British Columbia very often. So I, I mean, you think about what the Lord did right there. He knew that I'd always wanted to take a picture of the, of the Aurora. He, he knew that I was going to be speaking there. He did not have to make the Aurora appear for me right then. But he decided to let it happen. And I tell you what, I always try to take, use those photos that I've taken for his glory. 
so and share them with as many people as possible. So again, it's just a miracle that we see the things we do when it comes to the earth. We have an amazing moon. Our moon is one quarter the size of the earth. It's the largest moon proportionally out of all of the other moons in the entire solar system. Now, because of that, it actually helps stabilize Earth's axis. It helps circulate the warm and cold waters of the oceans. It affects our tides. It affects our temperature. Uh, so many different things that our moon does. And by the way, our moon, it's the largest moon proportionally, right, is perfectly sized to see a total solar eclipse. So the moon is just the right size to completely cover the face of the sun. Wait a second, the moon's not nearly as large as the sun. How is that even possible? Well, yeah, the sun is 400 times larger, but it's 400 times farther away. So proportionally, everything lines up perfectly. Coincidence? Well, you know what? Here's what I like asking people. How many, we have over 100 moons in our solar system. I mean, Jupiter, upwards of 50 moons, okay? Over 100 moons in our solar system. How many people on Jupiter, or how many planets, uh, moons, satellites of Jupiter are correctly sized to see a total solar eclipse? Zero. How many planets, how many satellites around a planet somewhere in our solar system, anywhere in our solar system, are correctly sized to see a total solar eclipse? One. And it just so happens we only have one moon to get it right, and we got it right. Again, there's no coincidence. We have a breathable atmosphere. Uh, only this combination of gases is known to exist uh, on Earth. There's no other place in the entire universe that has known to have this combination of gases. Uh, again, we can breathe easy because of that. We have a terrestrial planet. Couldn't live on Jupiter mostly gases, okay? But we have land, that's important. In addition to the land, we have an abundance of liquid water. Not just any water, liquid water, which is one of the rarest things you're gonna find throughout the universe. Well, we've got it in quite abundance because there was a large flood in the past. You know, when we look at all of these coincidences, I've never thought they were coincidences. There's really no way that they could be. I'm not surprised. Isaiah. 45 says, thus saith the Lord, God himself who formed the earth and made it, he established it, he created it not in vain, and he formed it to be inhabited. In other words, God made the earth for us, for you to live on. It's pretty special. So again, I'm not surprised. The Bible told us that the earth was made to be inhabited. It's a very special place. And, you know, when we start to look at all of these factors, these are just God's wonders without number. They're his, his little reminders, his little faith builders, I like to call them, that he's real. He's out there. And he loves you and me. He loves us a lot. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to turn to the universe. Before I do that, I want to uh, share a couple of things with you. I've written two books. Um, one is called 21 Verses Backed by Science, Deep in Your Faith. Um, the other is called Wonders Without Number, which covers a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight. I think they're probably both available on Amazon, probably, but they're definitely available on, uh, on our website, creationsuperstore.com, creationsuperstore.com. Just look up the title of the book and um, you can pick up a copy of those. Again, Wonders Without Number, Dr. Danny Faulkner, PhD in astronomy, wrote the foreword to it. Uh, it's a uh, color book and, uh, you know, full color pictures, um, lots of data, and I think you'll be blessed by it. It covers a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight. I host a TV show every week on TBN called Creation. Uh, it airs uh, every Saturday at around 1.30 Eastern time, I think that's right, on TBN. Uh, and then I host another TV show called Wonders Without Number that airs every um, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, I think it is, on DirecTV, on NRB Network, and it airs every weekday primetime on the largest cable provider in Israel, which is an amazing outreach and evangelism tool. Uh, we're really, really excited about that. And then Genesis Science Network, um, which Stacy mentioned uh, in the intro, is an amazing blessing to so many people. Uh, this is an outreach that we do 100% free of charge. 
just go to genesisciencenetwork.com and you can start watching the the television network right now it just starts playing automatically if you have roku download the roku app genesis science network uh 100 free if you have amazon fire tv or a fire stick or whatever you can watch it you can watch it on your smartphones and tablets genesis science network.com 24 7 content related to bible and science creation from a biblical perspective uh but all from a christian perspective and that's what makes it unique because you look at Discovery Channel or Nova or PBS or National Geographic and everything, everything there comes from an atheistic um, concept, a mindset. But we're changing the perspective with Genesis Science Network. We have testimonials, salvation reports, people sending in emails and comments from all over the world. Hundreds of thousands of people are watching this and they're being blessed by it. So uh, this is one of the greatest outreaches that uh, we've been able, the Lord's been able to, uh, he's allowed us to be a part of, and it's truly a blessing. Uh, if you would like to join me uh, September, this September in Kansas, uh, I lead a paleontological dig and teach you how to dig up dinosaur bones, how to dig up fossils in the field. So just text the word dino to 931-212-7990. Uh, in fact, I have friends here on the Zoom conference with me right now who were on the last dig. And um, I, I think everybody can safely say it was a blast. Everybody is a family by the time we leave. Whether you've ever put a spade in the ground, whether you've ever been good at finding fossils, you will be uh, by the time uh, by the time you leave Kansas. So if you want to go do that with me, I do that every uh, September. Uh, just uh, just text the word Dino to nine three one two one two seven nine nine zero. And this was my team last September. We found gigantic. We found the tail fin off of a big um, fourteen foot scissor tails of factinus. We found uh, well lots of things, which I will be releasing shortly. We just got new exhibits at the Wonder Center, and there's some significant finds that we're putting on display. So come see us. Uh, if you do want to join me uh, in Africa, I'm leading that trip uh, June of 2023. Uh, every other year, approximately, I lead a tour to Africa. Uh, we have about, you know, 40, 50 people, and I'll take you just as close as I can safely get you to live lions and giraffes and cheetahs and zebras and vervey monkeys and all of these different things. We stay at Christian resorts. It's really a blast. Uh, so you can text the word Africa to the same number to find out more and get a brochure. And if you are not already getting the Creation Club magazine, why are you not getting the Creation Club magazine? It is 100% free of charge. All you have to go uh, do is go to davidreeves.com slash magazine. I think it is. And or just go to the website and click on the magazine link and you can sign up for free. It's a print magazine. It uh, goes to your mailbox every other month, free of charge. Children's activities, um, uh, scientific articles. Uh, you know, layman's articles, all sorts of things. And it keeps you abreast with what our ministry is, is up to. You can find a lot more on our YouTube channel and you can also visit our Wonder Center here in Lewisburg, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. We have church groups and homeschool groups and bus tours and all sorts of exhibits and full-size dinosaurs and manuscripts dating back to the 1100s and ancient Torah scrolls and live events like our uh, premiere of God's Living Treasures, Animals of Alaska, our brand new documentary that we co-produced with uh, Dr. Job Martin, uh, a former um, uh, agnostic for sure, bordering on Zen Buddhism, until two of his students actually challenged him and said, well, what about creation? And he turned not only into a Christian, but into a Bible-believing creationist. And he goes around the world now talking about animals from a Christian perspective, we just finalized uh, God's Living Treasures, Animals of Alaska, Volume 3, the last in the series, where we look at the humpback whale and the leatherback turtle and the lynx and that bald eagle. I went up to Canada and filmed with a bald eagle sitting face right off of my shoulder, had to wear sunglasses uh, and a ball cap because uh, it could peck your eyes out before you even knew it. So <laughs> I risked my life for this documentary, but we're really excited. It turned out really well. 
Uh, if you are looking for any other resources, visit the creationsuperstore.com, creationsuperstore.com, uh, whether it's the Starlight and Time issue or our books and videos or anything that Answers in Genesis has ever produced or Institute for Creation Research has produced or Creation Ministries International has ever produced or the Creation Research Society has ever produced, we stock, sell, and ship from right here. Over 1,300 different books and videos right here in our studios uh, south of Nashville. So not only can you help support those other ministries, but you can also help support us a little bit because we make a little bit off of each sale of their books and our own uh, creationsuperstore.com, the largest collection in the world. Uh, I've hosted a number of documentaries by the Creation Research Society, documentaries on hummingbirds, documentaries on all sorts of things, which you can check out on that website and also join our social media accounts. If you follow uh, Facebook, or if you follow Twitter or TikTok, we've got millions and millions of uh, followers and views on those platforms. Now, we've talked about wonders of mathematics. We've talked about wonders of our special earth. We've talked about wonders in the universe, but only so far as it serves our galaxy, all right? We looked at the Milky Way galaxy. Now we're going to broaden it out before we close it out. And before I do that, I really have to talk about the foundation of one more scientist. Another famous scientist, Dr. Werner von Braun, famous for sending men to the moon, famous for uh, being involved with a government organization, all right, the leader of a government organization. What was his foundation unapologetically? For me, the idea of a creation is inconceivable without God. It's a bold statement, isn't it? And this was not that many years ago, how things have changed. Can you imagine the leader of NASA saying this? No, for me, the idea of creation is inconceivable without God. He said a lot of people look at science and religion as antagonists. They're not, they're sisters. While science tries to better understand creation, religion tries to better understand the creator. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying that you can't have creation without a creator. You can't have design without a designer. It doesn't work. The only logical way to explain the universe and everything that we've seen so far in it is to say that God exists. So this was his foundation. Is it true? Well, you know me. Uh, if you've seen anything that we've ever produced, uh, over 850 pieces of media, you've probably heard me use the phrase, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19.1 says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. It says that day after day utters speech and night after night shows knowledge, but there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So it's almost like the heavens are shouting out that they're screaming at us, that there is a grand designer, that you're not cosmic accidents, that you're not star stuff, the result of 14 billion years of evolution, but that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. So yes, the heavens are shouting God's creation. So the way I got into ministry was using very large telescopes, observatory class telescopes to take astrophotography, photos of space. Uh, for instance, the Great Orion Nebula that you see on the screen there, I took that picture a number of years ago. Uh, it was actually one of the things that helped spark this ministry. And then I realized, well, why is, why is this a hobby? Why couldn't we be using this to actually share the gospel message itself? Uh, this is the Rosette Nebula that I actually took with that telescope behind me, not a huge telescope. Yes, uh, the Rosette Nebula looks like a rose in space. So I'm passionate about astronomy. Last time I was in South Africa, I snapped this picture that you see on the screen. Uh, this is around our boma, our campfire, where we eat dinner each night. And I went outside of the enclosure where the campfire was, and I took this picture of the Milky Way galaxy. It's so vivid out in, in Africa, uh, South Africa, where there's no light pollution where, where we're at. And uh, you can see one star, I'm gonna to point to it with an arrow. See that little star? Uh, that is um, our closest star. It's called Proxima Centauri. And uh, that is about 4.3 light years away. All right, now everybody's heard of Einstein's theory of relativity. I'm not getting into that tonight. No, way too complicated. Instead, I'm gonna give you the Reeves theory of relativity. Yeah, I can have my own. If Einstein can have his, I can have the Reeves theory of relativity. Simply stated, if your relatives can't understand what you're talking about, use simpler terms, all right? We use terms like astronomical units and parsecs and, um, and light years, right? Well, 4.3 light years doesn't sound like that far, but how many people actually realize that a light year is the distance light would travel at 12 million miles a minute after an entire year? Okay, a light year is a long ways. 
So traveling to our closest star at the speed of our fastest spacecraft, the Voyager and New Horizons spacecraft, currently traveling 40,000 miles per hour, it would take us about 70,000 years just to reach our closest star. The Eagle Nebula, oh, that's about 117 million years traveling at the speed of our fastest spacecraft. So looking at the Reeves theory of relativity, what we see is that light years, that doesn't do it justice. The speed of our fastest spacecraft, it would take 419 million years to see to reach what you see on the screen, okay? 48 billion years to reach our sister galaxy, Andromeda. 500 billion years to reach the Whirlpool Galaxy. So truly, God has done great things past finding out and wonders without number. Everything we see in the universe points back to him. But you know what? In this vast universe, way too large for us to fathom, God cared enough about us. You see, he sent his only begotten son to this tiny speck floating in space to live, die, be raised again, to pay for our sins, the sins of the world. He loves us that much. He wants us to be a part of his family for eternity. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him without him. Was not anything made that was made. John 1.10 says that he was in the world. The world was made by him, and yet the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own didn't even receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, Colossians 1 says, by him were all things created that were in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. He's before all things, and by him all things consist. This is the ultimate wonder, y'all. This is the ultimate wonder that I'm going to tell you about, and it's Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what we read in the book of Genesis? God said, let there be light. Well, what does Jesus say? He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. They'll have the light of life. So in other words, just as the great wonders in the sky above are examples of his workmanship, we're his workmanship. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in this vast universe, we need to remember to thank our creator for what he has given us as believers, the privilege of eternal life and eternal enjoyment of his creation. As it's written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has made for those who love him. God has great plans for your life. He loves you so much that he wants you to be a part of his family for eternity. He loves you so much that he left his throne to come down to this tiny rock in that vast universe to save us from our sins. I'm David Reeves. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. That was great. Thank you. Um, we're going to still let the um, recording run for just a little bit yet. Um, I... Did you were you watching the chat? No, I have not actually had the chat pulled up. I'm just going to pull it up right now. I think it was just mostly me blathering on. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing those links. Uh, that is great, and Terry, you you as well. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. You let it run as long as you'd like. I, I you know, I know some people aren't comfortable putting their pictures on, turning their cameras on. But I, I'm perfectly comfortable doing Q&A live if you want to keep the recording going. So you, you feel perfectly free to do that, at least for a portion, if you feel led to. Okay. Um, so I had a question. What is the Dasha theory? The, near the end there, you, what is that? Yeah, the Dasha theory, there's a word in Genesis that is used a bunch of times. So when it says that God, God said, uh, let the earth spring forth every living thing, or let this bring forth this. Well, the word bring forth, translated in different ways in different Bibles, that word in Hebrew is dasha. And dasha basically means a rapid maturing, something that within the course of a day, 24 hours at least, maybe minutes, we don't know, but certainly within the course of a day, God rapidly matured things uh, from maybe like a little seedling to a giant 
sequoia tree. All right, so if God rapidly matured things, this might help us understand the starlight and time dilemma. Uh, you know, atheists always challenge us and they say, well, how do you get starlight from galaxies millions of light years away if the universe is only 6,000 years old? Well, it's really easy because light year is a measurement of distance, not time. Just because it's millions of light years away does not mean that it takes millions of years for that light to get there. And dasha, this Hebrew word of rapid maturing, might actually help us understand how God did that. Oh, that's very good. I uh, I know that um, Dr. Uh, Lyle, um, you know, was kind of uh, dabbling in in that, and uh, I never heard him use that word um, dasha. That is very that is very good. If you're, um, if you're interested in more information, just uh, you can do a digital download or a DVD. It's called Dasha Theory. It's a DVD that uh, I did with my friend, uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, PhD in astronomy. Uh, and we look at that Hebrew word specifically and how it might help us solve the starlight time dilemma. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get that. Um, let me ask Terry, are there any? Um, <clears throat> Go ahead. Lyle has, Lyle, Lyle has another thesis on that. And that's that and as God stretched out the heavens, if the earth was in the center, of what you basically would call a white hole, as things got stretched out, the light from the edge of the galaxy could travel at current speeds of light, and the light in the white hole would not be traveling at all because it was spinning outward. Yeah, that's actually uh, Dr. another good friend, Dr. Russell Humphreys. He has his PhD mm -hmm. in physics. He's the one that really pioneered that white hole cosmology and he looked at the dynamics of it. And I have a DVD that he and I did called um, Starlight and Starlight in a Young Universe. Um, and we look at that, that possible expansion from Earth being close to the center of the universe. Uh, Lyle, again, he's a friend, uh, but Dr. Jason Lyle actually looks at the anisotropic light synchrony convention. And that basically is not so much of a theory on how to explain starlight and time, but it's, it's more of an observation that we don't even know how fast the one-way <laughs> speed of light is. So it's oh, a yeah. really, really neat concept. Yeah, definitely. We don't know because you can't measure anything but the round trip speed of light. That's right. And we have no way of knowing whether it goes out at the same speed as it comes back in. That's so correct. that's what you summarized there. Um, one thing I've been playing with lately is Scripture seems to speak of a 365-day year with a lunar month of uh, 30 days. And yet we have something that's different than that now. Do you have any thoughts on how we got that difference? Yeah, you know, that's something that I have not actually studied in depth. Uh, I think I have read, I think there's a chapter of one of the books that I've read that attempts to address that, but I have not studied that topic in depth. So I, I probably wouldn't feel comfortable addressing it. Well, let me give you a thought on that. Have you heard of the uh, catastrophic plate tectonics? Yes, yeah, CPT. So what happens in catastrophic plate tectonics is you have the old oceans, which are heavier, moving downward and going towards you know, down 900 miles or so. If you've ever seen a ice skater go into a spin, when she pulls her arms in, the spin speeds up. Right. So in essence, the earth was pulling its arm in and providing enough to speed it up 2%. If you move the center of gravity, closer towards the center of the earth, then yeah, that would indeed result in, uh, in speeding things up. Uh, and we do know that the, uh, that the earth is a, an oblate spheroid, ever so slightly. It is an oblate spheroid. In other words, it's not a perfect sphere. Uh, it is actually a little bit compressed right around the, uh, the equator there because it has greater um, gravitational pull right there. So, I mean, that's a, it's a legitimate observation using physics, so. Thank you, Ram. 
Um, Rob was asking that question uh, uh, to another uh, speaker as well, and we have not. Um, uh, I guess we might have to have um, Danny Faulkner on, huh? Yes, absolutely. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, so, anyways, there were no questions in Facebook. Um, if any, does anybody want to unmute, leave your cameras off until we're done recording, and like Rob did, and ask a question? Some of our people are shy, David. <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, no, that's it's perfectly fine. If anybody has a question, you just uh, just shout it out right now. And if anybody's still watching on Facebook, if you have a question, you can definitely write it in the comments. Well, I have some questions about the um, Africa trip. Now, did you go in 2021 or 2022? Wait, what, what year are we in? We're in 2022. I went in 2021, but I always do the thing in June and usually every other year approximately. Um, so I'm not doing it this June. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was there at the height of COVID actually. I mean, like, you know, it was fears of COVID were, were gripping the world at that point. And South Africa was supposedly the hub for all of this. <laughs> and I was there with 40 or 50 people, uh, from all over. Usually most of them were from America and, um, we had zero issues with that. Uh, the hardest part about it was wearing a mask on a 24 hour flight, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was a tremendous trip. Uh, I mean, we went hot air ballooning over the African bush field and actually, uh, you know, I had my long, long lens on my camera and I've got these herds of zebra walking across the African plains and, uh, uh, and then at one point we got within 15 feet of a cheetah. Um, and at one point we got within 50 feet of a male African lion. And we also got to interact with uh, African elephants, which as you know, those are, those are the big ones, the giant ones. Oh, that is so cool. I know I see, I saw your pictures and I really want to do it, but I won't, um, I won't wear a mask. Certainly won't wear one for 15 24 hours and i will not get the shot oh um it looks like bill bill, uh, bill, bill has the question yeah go, hi, go ahead yeah hi 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 david this is bill yes. i had a question uh years and decades ago probably by now i read a book or, or a chapter in a book about that, that tried to explain and kind of did explain in the old testament i think it was around joshua's time and maybe another time where the, the sun stood still for 24 hours and another time when the sun actually went backwards 10 degrees or 13 degrees or something. And there were some Christian apologetics that used that. But I can't remember how I either loaned the book or gave it away or lost it. And I can't remember what they were saying about those two uh, times where the earth stood still or something, whatever, yeah. the sun didn't move. And then the, the dial moved back 10 degrees. Is there, there any were, Christian apologetics on that or anything? So there in the past, there have been a, a few resources that said that they believed that they were able to find the, you know, those missing hours uh, in, in history. And some of them even went as far as to say that NASA had found them. There's not good evidence for that. Um, That's what I, I kind of sort of remember. Yeah, I, I really wouldn't use that as, as a, a top uh, <laughs> apologetics evidence. Uh, again, it was circulating a number of years ago, but uh, I haven't looked at all of the figures, but the figures that they were showing, they don't, they don't quite add up. So scientists are stumped and, and Christians are stumped on that one, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have no idea. Our perception of time comes from, yes, the cycle of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and, and all of that, but it ultimately comes from God. So could God simply change our perception of time and stop everything? Absolutely, he can do that. And I mean, 
obviously he did something like that. It was a miraculous act. This was, this was definitely not something that happens in nature. And when you say miraculous, you know, skeptics, they immediately, they go, ah, so you're, you're appealing to the supernatural. That's what you Christians always do. Ah, you just, anything you can't explain, you just say, oh, your God did it. And we admit that we have faith that God can work miracles, but there are things that we have seen in this natural world that cannot be explained by naturalistic principles. In other words, the origin of the universe itself, the origin of matter, for instance, can't be explained by any natural law or any physics that we understand. So what does that mean? If the universe actually cannot be created using natural laws, it breaks laws of, of nature and laws of science. If the universe can't be created using natural laws, then that means that the universe must have been created in the supernatural. And I mean, even the atheistic professors will have to admit that a lot of their ideas break natural laws of science. Thanks, David. I appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, that was uh, very good. Um, David, we have one more question from Anonymous iPhone. Hi, iPhone. Did you want to ask a question? Okay. Is, is, um, this is this Teresa? Can you hear me? Oh, there you are, Chris. Okay, Teresa, go ahead. Ask your question. Oh, I didn't know. I, I'm muted, so I'm on this. Um, can I hear this uh, presentation again? I loved it. I, I was writing notes like crazy, and I couldn't get enough information. Can I watch this again? I mean, I know it's live, but is your um, wonders by number without numbers like this that you just did, David? Yeah, you can uh, you you can get my book uh, if you want to study it a little bit more carefully. The book goes into a lot more detail on some things and less detail on some things, obviously, because this was a very loose, fluid presentation. But uh, yeah, you can you can get my book Wonders Without Number from CreationSuperstore.com, and most of the things discussed specifically I have videos on. I don't have a uh, a dedicated video. Uh, on everything we talked about tonight, but you can uh, always go back on the Facebook Live and watch that again, replay that. Uh, okay, and then over. you said God created by weight, measures, and what was the other one? By number, weight, and measure. Oh, by number. So, um, in other words, literally, we're talking, <laughs> we're talking about mathematics again. Uh, yeah. Everybody that studied, uh, I'll pull it up. Everybody that studied the natural world realized that numbers, mathematical figures, require an intelligence or else we wouldn't even be able to comprehend those things. The fact that we can reduce mathematical principles and even laws of the universe to an equation on a scrap of paper indicates that these things are highly ordered, that these are not chaotic accidents, the result mm -hmm. of time and chance, but instead are the results of an intelligence who formed the earth. And so uh, Newton actually wrote more on the Bible and prophecy than he wrote on science. And few, very few people know that little uh, tidbit about Sir Isaac Newton. He was quite the, the biblical scholar. Wow. So your store is, can you tell me the name of the store again? The store is called creationsuperstore.com. And the Creation Superstore has over 1,300 different titles, books, videos, uh, homeschool resources, actual fossils, um, uh, Bible study, Sunday school studies, a video series. It has over 120 products that we have produced in our ministry, and it has everything that Answers in Genesis has ever produced. Institute for Creation Research has ever, it's the largest origins related store in the entire world. And we keep it all in stock right here at the Wonder Center. So we, uh, we ship it out to Australia and England and all across America every day. And that's in Lewisburg, Tennessee? Yeah, it's about, uh, it's about 50, you know, 45 minutes south of Nashville uh, mm -hmm. off of the I-65 corridor. And mm -hmm. so that's where our ministry offices are located. That's where our studios, where I'm at right now, 
are located. Uh, that's where Genesis Science Network broadcasts from, our 24-7 our network, and we have our store here. Wow, thank you so much. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you, um, Teresa. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and uh, mute Teresa, I'm going to have David uh, tell us once again, well, you've just told us a few times, but um, about um, where we can find you and then have you pray to close us. And then I'm going to close out Facebook Live and the recording, and then we can all um, relax. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I would just really encourage everybody to go to davidreeves.com. It's kind of the shorthand to get you everywhere you need to go. David Reeves, David, R-I-V-E-S.com will get you to the Creation Superstore. It will get you to the 24-7 TV network live stream. It will get you to our free magazine, the Creation Club magazine. Uh, you can sign up for it right there. It will get you to our free uh, weekly emails. Uh, and it will, all of our free resources are linked to on the front page. Oh, and also our podcast, our, our audio podcast, uh, changing the narrative. Everything's right there on the front page of davidreeves.com. That's kind of the shorthand uh, for all of our free resources. And then you can go to creation, uh, creationsuperstore.com for the paid stuff, obviously, which does help us out. But we are really passionate about sharing the gospel with the world. And I appreciate you all having me tonight. Um, I'd love to pray before we go. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to share about you and your creation. We thank you for all the blessings and, um, and just for allowing us to breathe a, another breath of air, for giving us a planet that uh, has land so that we can stand on it, for giving us a planet that has a breathable atmosphere, for loving us enough to come down to earth to allow us to be a part of your family for eternity. We pray that everyone here that uh, has been with us tonight has accepted you uh, and is looking forward to being a part of your family, to seeing you. Uh, and we pray that maybe there's somebody who has not uh, made that decision, who has not received you, uh, who might be listening tonight. And we pray that you just touch their hearts right now and let them understand that everything there are no coincidences. Everything's pointing back to you. Everything's pointing to your fingerprints of design. Everything is pointing back to Jesus and back to the gospel. Just touch their hearts tonight and let them know that they're not accidents, that they're not star stuff, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, made in your image, made with a purpose. And of course, that purpose can only be seen if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We just thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, David. Hey, I just want to bring to the attention, the, everyone's attention, that um, 